Hello everybody, I have a short video for you for help on homework number one. The first page should go fairly quickly if you're looking at problems one, two, and three. They're answered in section 11.1, 11.2, in table 11.1. You can use figure 11.8 to answer question number four. Just make sure that you um, label the y-axis, well put the y-axis name in this blank here and the x-axis over here. And that's uh, being careful about the word versus in the middle. Problem number five, you can find the definition of triple point in section 11.6. Figure 11.11 .11 can help you answer these multiple choice questions about the gas laws or you can refer to your team discussion from the uh, class the other day. The definition of the first law of thermodynamics can be found in section 11.13. The same is true for the second law of thermodynamics. To make sure that when you answer this question, you want to put it in uh, your own words, so not a quote out of the textbook, but what does it mean to you? When you're looking at problem number 11, the two things to recognize is that you have a temperature and pressure variation in the problem. That means that you can identify which equation fairly easily to use from the collection of the four main gas laws that we talked about. That can be found in figure 11.11. .11. That's Charles's law, Boyle's law, etc. For problem number 12, you can just use the ideal gas equation. There, there doesn't seem to be any kind of um, unit conversion required on this problem, so it should be straightforward algebra. On problem 13, you'll want to use the equation that relates temperature and volume changes. There's a direct relationship between those two. I want to talk about this problem because in semesters past, what students have done is taken the 50 meters and just plug that in for the initial volume. But you have to realize that 50 meters is the height measured in meters where a volume should be in meters cubed. So the connection is this, that the volume is related to the area of the top of the chamber times, or the top of the container, times the height. And the top of the container, uh, well, it could be pi r square for the area if it's uh, cylindrical, or it could be, you know, length times width if it's a square container. The problem doesn't really say, but then again, it doesn't really matter because as long as you take the area times the height, then you can get the volume. So you can put V2 and H2 and V1A H1 like this and not have to put any subscripts on the A because the area remains fixed throughout the day in this particular problem. So then solving for V1 and V2, substituting those into that equation, you can then use your algebra skills to figure out what H2 is and that's the answer that goes here. So make sure that you use H's, not V's, um, as you get closer to the end of this problem. Uh, for problem 14, what you'll use is that the heat capacity is equal to the amount of heat divided by the mass of the water that you're trying to raise the temperature of times the change in temperature delta T. If you realize the equivalence here that the work is going into heat production, you can just put a W there. And then after that, you realize that the hence here is that the work is just a force times distance, so then you can solve and substitute again. I think the force is given in the problem and also the mass of the water, but if the mass of the water is not given, you can always use density equals mass times volume. You're solving for delta T first of all, and I guess just watch, just, uh, watch all of your unit conversions there. And the last part is to find the final temperature is equal to the initial temperature plus delta T. Um, so it doesn't say TF down here, but that's really what they're looking for in the problem. Just uh, something to help you out in the end, um, this delta T will be fairly small. So although you put considerable work into it, which gets converted over to heat, the temperature doesn't raise um, all that much for the water. Hope this helps.